Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here with week 2 of Weapons Month. This is the big one. Besides different types of guns, swords are easily the most common weapons in video games and in works of fiction in general. As early as man learned how to hit things with sticks, early innovation led the simple bludgeon to become a reliable cutting tool. The sword is one of the most international of martial weapons, and it branches out into so many categories such as short swords, rapiers, claymores, katanas, sabers, scimitars, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Along with all of these, video games give us an armory of even more unique swords like buster swords, gun blades, keyblades, lightsaber ripoffs, and so much more. With so many different knights, samurai, ninjas, pirates, and other sword wielders in video games, narrowing it down to just 10 was no small task. For this list, it's more about how the character expresses their own unique traits through their swordsmanship. Get ready, because here, I'll be presenting the top 10 greatest video game sword wielders. Now, keep this in mind, there are a lot of great swordsmen who did not make the cut. So if your favorite didn't make it, leave it in the comments, because we would love to hear them. Alright, let's begin! Starting the list off is the fan-favorite amphibian known only as Frog. His real name is Glenn, but in Chrono Trigger he finds himself cursed into the shape of a swamp-dwelling Anura. Granted, if put together in a duel, Chrono would probably outmatch Frog. But there is just something about the Green Knight that makes him too lovable to omit. He has a regal devotion to the Queen of the Medieval Era, and being a knight, he symbolizes the nobility of a royal swordsman more than anyone else on the list. His animal shape also gives him a unique fighting style. He hops, flips, and jumps with his weapon. He and Chrono also have one of the most iconic double techs in the game. The sword he wields also grants him some points. The legendary Masamune is a force to be reckoned with, and even has a sentient form that is one of the harder bosses in the game. Even Chrono himself can't wield it. Add some water magic and the ability to summon a giant rainbow toad, Frog is a gentleman that I would trust to fight Lavos with at any day of the week. But what really puts Frog over the edge was this scene, where Frog cuts a mountain in half to open the way to Magus's castle. Holy toads! Can he always do that, or is that a one-time thing? Hey, hey Frog, do that to Lavos, if you wouldn't mind. It is with a heavy heart that I can only put Link this high on the list. He single-handedly started the sword-stabbing craze for the industry, and he is no slouch, with a style all his own. However, the next eight are just too good to give Link a buy just because I like him. That said, Link deserves recognition for more than just how long he's been in the evil smiting business. Link's fighting style with his sword and shield is truly unique, even in an industry of constant imitation. Yes, Link is proficient with more weapons than Frank West that can usually switch into using them whenever he wants, but without all of his toys and gadgets that basically make him a walking Swiss Army knife, Link has a growing move list all his own. Let's name just a few of his signature sword techniques. The up thrust for taking out pesky bats, and more importantly, the pogo stick of death. There's a tornado spin for dealing with surrounding threats, and the more powerful hurricane spin, turning him into an uncontrollable whirly dervish of slicing power. He can also channel his energy through his sword into a sword beam or skyward strike, and while keeping his eye, or Z-targeting fairy on the enemy, he is adept at dodging and rolling around the enemy, or even jumping over them to hit their weak spot. Skyward Sword puts even more emphasis on the importance of good swordsmanship in Hyrule, but for my rupees, his best move is the Mortal Draw from Twilight Princess. Link keeps his blade sheathed until the very last moment before instantly downing his foes. Link has used a variety of swords in his multiple lives and incarnations. Most notable is, of course, the Master Sword, which emanates righteousness and drives away evil. But let's not forget the equally powerful Picori Blade, better known as the Four Sword, which multiplies him into a colorful and often very dysfunctional quartet, as well as the Big Goron Sword, a huge weapon that Link has no trouble whipping around, even if he uses his shield arm. 
Link is one of the greatest heroes in gaming, and we know he'll be perfecting his swordcraft for many years to come. As seen with Margaret Moonlight in the best Scythe Wielders countdown, having two of a given weapon really boosts your chances of making it on the list. That being said, the number 8 spot goes to Lloyd Irving from Tales of Symphonia. Lloyd is one of those classic anime-like young boys who sleeps in class and never applies himself, yet aspires to be the best and actually does it. Gee, I wonder why that sounds familiar. Well, Lloyd does have a little help from his x fear which is a magical bead attached to his skin that magically increases his most outstanding attributes. In this case, his agility, handling, and whininess. Actually, I take that back. Lloyd has every right to whine. After all, he was orphaned as a child, banished from his village, and has to deal with the fact that Colette, his would-be girlfriend, is going to be leaving this world as a part of a ritualistic cycle. Also, Lloyd grows a lot by the end of the game, and by the sequel Dawn of the New World, he is able to help Emil with his equally earth-shattering rite of passage. Lloyd is kind of the tolerable version of Titus. In fact, a lot of this game is like Final Fantasy X. The pilgrimage, the religion, the mysterious mentor... Hmm... Huh. And anyway, about his sword skills. Lloyd is actually at one point saying that the only reason he fights with two swords is that he thought it would automatically make fighting half as difficult. Oh Lloyd. We would forget your awesome skill if not for your amazing vertical cartwheels and tiger-shaped waves of sword energy. Lloyd has a myriad of flashy moves that are all quick and painful, and a practice player will find that they all flow really well into one another if the timing is mastered. And that's just when he's a kid. In the sequel, Lloyd is something of a renegade, his motives suddenly very unclear. We're not sure anymore if he is fighting for Silverant, Tethala, or his own greed, but we know that he can dispatch an army or raise a town with just two blades. As much as Lloyd just wanted to nap in class, he kinda has his hands full right now, each with a sword. Meta Knight may be small, and he is kind of adorable in his own super serious, I don't have time for your tomfoolery sort of way. And behind that mask, he's actually just as cute as Kirby. But he is the greatest warrior in all of the Kirby universe. And we have proof of this, because when given one wish, he wished to fight the greatest warrior in all of the Kirby universe. And lo and behold, he tore him to shreds. We could talk about how he carries the team in Return to Dreamland, or how his pursuit in Meta Knight's Revenge really shows off his power. But for the real exhibition, look no further than Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Considering that both the Kirby series and the Smash Bros. series are developed by HAL Laboratories, it's clear that HAL really wanted us to know that Meta Knight is amazing. With his orange, sawtooth short sword known as Excalibur, he swipes so fast it makes Link look like a sloth. A lot of quick combo moves like his drill spins and tornado keep his opponents in stitches, and he completely controls the air above the battlefield. Hal tried to nerf him by having all of his specials put him into a freefall, but it doesn't make a difference. He's just too vicious! In fact, he's the only character to be banned in brawl tournaments. With his speed, ferocity, and demure, this masked warrior takes the number 7 spot on my list. I had a lot of trouble picking a swordsman from the Final Fantasy series. For the most part, it was between Cloud and Sephiroth. Cloud's ability to wield a buster sword that is heavier than he is while omni-lashing enemies into oblivion is truly impressive, but Sephiroth and his 20-foot long katana are nothing to sneeze at, particularly in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. Then with contenders like Squall, Zidane, Edge, Cecil, Shadow, Celis, and Steiner walking around, this was a tough one. But in the end, I finally went with the serene but skilled Ori. As annoying as I found Final Fantasy X's story and voice acting, the battle system is actually really deep and fun to use, and Orin, along with Kamari, was the only character that didn't make me want to pull my hair out. A cool-headed figure who has seen a lot of the world by the time he meets Titus, 
Orin doesn't fall into any of the regular Final Fantasy character annoyances of being whiny, broody, self-absorbed, or mindlessly cocky. He can be a little cryptic sometimes, since he's clearly the only person in the game who really understands the plot, but he's just overall a cool character. He also looks the part, with a grizzled face, some whiskey to help him through the day, those sunglasses, the scar, and the apparently injured arm that doesn't seem to stop him from doing some serious damage in battle. Sure, in Final Fantasy X you can eventually fill up everyone's sphere grid so that everyone can do anything, but let's talk about just the main skill track for Orin. Orin specializes in doing damage, piercing through tough defenses, and lowering the enemy's stats with moves like Armor Break, Mental Break, and Power Break. He is the vanguard of the group, and the one you bring out when you want to unload damage as quickly as possible. He has no problem handling that Buster Sword and rivals Cloud's in human dexterity with it. Orin really became something special for me in the Albed Desert, when I discovered that he could bat sandworms into space despite them being 10 times his size. You may be angry that I didn't pick a different Final Fantasy character, and for that I apologize, but this is my story. Ugh, I can't believe I just said that. With his lightning-fast reflexes and his ability to cut planes in half, Ryu Hayabusa is not only the greatest ninja in gaming, he is also one of the greatest swordsmen. Ryu has a long history of fighting psychopaths, wizards, and other ninjas in his pursuit of justice. He has been in the industry for over two decades, and with the possible exception of the new Ninja Gaiden 3, he has not shown his age. Granted, Ryu can get by without a sword, and in other games he has used a variety of weapons from claws to spears to, well, sights. And he is no rookie at hand-to-hand -hand combat, as seen in the Dead or Alive franchise. But when the going gets rough, Ryu goes with his trusty katana. With the legendary blade, the Dragon Sword, Ryu throws fire into the mix, while effortlessly liberating arms from their sockets. And even when his enemies are packing firearms, Ryu is one to bring a sword to a gunfight, and usually wins. Of course, the Ninja Gaiden games are known for their ruthless difficulty, so it might be taken that Ryu actually isn't that powerful, since it's so easy to die in the games to enemy ninjas or constantly respawning falcons. But here's the thing, Ryu is so amazing a ninja that he is designed to never be hit. It's not he who was untrained, but us. Ninja Gaiden is one of the few games where we lose because we're just not as awesome as the main character. Don't hate on Ryu, it's not his fault we suck. These next four still need to be skillful, but with swords being such a blank slate for self-expression, I find I am more interested in the unique warriors that can set themselves apart from all the other knives in the drawer. That being said, the number 4 spot goes to the Beam Katana wielding Otaku Master, Travis Touchdown. So why should Travis automatically get the spot when there are so many other Sword Masters in the UAA? There's Death Metal with his compactable Buster Sword, Shinobu who can shoot sonic waves, as well as Mr. Sir Henry himself. Heck, Alice Twilight has 5 Beam Katanas that she uses simultaneously, presumably to just to outdo General Grievous. But here's the thing. Travis Touchdown beats all of these people, plus astronauts, samurais, and demon children, with nothing but a few swords and some Lucha Libre grabs. Travis is the ultimate underdog. The Bean Katanas don't even immediately sever limbs like lightsabers unless Travis puts a lot of force behind them, in which case his opponents explode into blood and coins. Travis doesn't have a lot going for him, but he makes it work and defeats all of these incredibly well-trained assassins. We also get to see Travis use a number of different sword styles, including a regular lightsaber shape, a huge longsword, a Japanese katana, and his deadly twin swords. Travis is the bare minimum, but he's one of the best. Again, this franchise is really difficult to pick just one fighter from. At first, it was a three-way tie between Siegfried's mountain-sized claymore, Mitsurugi's skillful samurai moves, and Raphael's elegant fencing. There is also Yun Sung, who has a pretty wicked scimitar, but relies more on his crazy kicks, and I don't even know how to classify Ivy. But then, I realized that the most wonderful swordsman of the universe was standing right there, waving a flag. Yoshimitsu. 
How could it be anyone else? Yoshimitsu can do things with a sword that no one else could ever attempt. He stands on it, uses the pogo stick of death, uses it to heal himself, and even flies by spinning it like a propeller. How does that even work? Because he's freaking Yoshimitsu, damn it! Yoshimitsu also keeps a second sword concealed up his sleeve just in case, and even that silly flag on his back, though not his primary source of damage, is used as one of the more unexpected ways to deal damage and look gleefully ridiculous while dominating the battlefield. Despite his playfulness, Yoshimitsu preaches honor in being a warrior, and when given the chance to slay the almighty Algal, Yoshimitsu instead tells him to seek recompense and then flies away like a helicopter. Man, I love this guy! There is also his successor from the Tekken series, also called Yoshimitsu, but I've always preferred Soul Calibur's Yoshimitsu because of how unique he is. With style, discipline, skill, and a lot of fun, Yoshimitsu flies into the number 3 spot. Fire Emblem presented yet another dilemma in choosing the best of blades, especially since a number of protagonists are great swordsmen. Marth, the original Fire Emblem Lord, is a quick and skillful duelist in his games, as well as in the Smash Bros. series. Roy's weapon, the Fui no Tsurugi, is completely broken. Ike was one of our top 10 heroes, so why not him? Especially since he swings a two-handed broadsword with one hand, and his Aether attack is both flashy and devastating. But not only will it feel wrong to include Ike when I didn't include Cloud, but there are two sword fighters in this series that have made a huge impact in terms of memorability, characterization, and swordsmanship. Lindis and Joshua. In truth, there are countless swordsmen in the Fire Emblem series. In terms of the Swordmaster class, Zyhark, Mia, Marissa, Stefan, Lucia, Edward, Rad, and Guy are all great examples. However, none of them have slashed their way into the memory of gamers quite like these two Masters of the Blade. Lindis, or Lin, was raised in the plains but turns out to actually be the Princess of Kaelin. She is the only person capable of drawing the blade known as the Manikati. Plus, later on during the final chapter, she wields the Soul Kati, which is arguably the most devastating sword in the whole game. She has all the qualities of a true Swordmaster also exploiting her own unique battle animations and an appearance as an assist trophy in Brawl. Joshua is a wandering sellsword who decides his fate with a flip of a coin. He sells his skill to Grado, but joins Erika's side when he falls for the priestess Natasha. Like other swordmasters, he crits constantly with the most amazing attack animations in the game, and dodges by casually tilting his head back. Unlike most other famous gaming swordsmen, Joshua isn't attached to a particular sword. Following his lofty loyalty to any army, Joshua is comfortable with any sword he is given, including rune swords and wind edges. The ensemble dark horse of the game, Joshua is actually discovered to be a prince who ran away from home. If he survives to reunite with Queen Ismer, he will eventually buckle down and take his rightful place as king. So yeah, Joshua can literally run circles around Ike, and he, along with Lindis, have truly earned their namesakes. This has been a tough list, and number one is within reach. But before we get there, let's recap. Number 10, Frog. Number 9, Link. Number 8, Lloyd Irving. Number 7, Meta Knight. Number 6, Orin. Number 5, Ryu Hayabusa. Number 4, Travis Touchdown. Number 3, Yoshimitsu. And number 2, Lindis and Joshua. Remember how the Wii came out and a little game called Red Steel claimed to have one-on-one -on -one sword swinging action? Remember how it totally ended up being an average first person shooter with really subpar sword sections? Remember how dozens of games for the Wii tried and failed to bring a similar sword fighting experience? Well, thanks to Wii Motion Plus, the game that finally achieved it before Skyward Sword was Red Steel 2, where we find my number one sword wielder in gaming, the Kusagati. The last of the Kusagati clan, 
the swordsman lives in a very distinct world that blends the old American West with feudal Japan. He himself looks like a desperado samurai, and his fighting style blends the two seamlessly. Although the Kusagari has four guns up his sleeve, his sword, forged from a one-of-a-kind metal, is his main method of attack. Everything in this game is upgradable, and the swordsman learns all of his late clan's mystical techniques. A move called the Eagle flips enemies 10 feet into the air, after which you can either take a page from Devil May Cry and juggle them in the air with a blanket of bullets, or flash step to them and spike them to the ground. The Tiger is a counter move that blocks, parries, and stuns opponents who aren't smart about their attacks. A whirlwind move a la Legend of Zelda hits multiple enemies around him, and the bear pounds the ground with his sword, sending out shockwaves and leaving nearby foes prone to quick dash and stab or a sidestep and trip. Tripping opponents allows for a variety of quick finishes, and the Viper gives the Kusagari a surprising reach with his fatal swipes. The Kusagari feels like a mix of all the greatest swordsmen in gaming, but more importantly, the game gives players one-to-one -one first person control over his amazing and varied techniques. In truth, video games are abundant with awesome sword masters, but if you want to feel like the number one sword wielder of all time, step into the boots of the Kusagari. I'm the Green Scorpion, see you guys next time.